What's important? What do you want? Thank you all for, for coming. Nice to have you. Nice to be with you. So let me go over the fundamentals that I've worked with you on over these last weeks. And the first one is your impulse to breathe and your attention to your impulse to breathe and the distinction between when you take a breath with the conscious mind or the conscious identity and when you're not paying attention and you're still breathing and then I I kind of I'm always working on my comedy act you should know that uh, I kind of jokingly ask well is that you breathing or isn't that you breathing and which one is the real you or which you am I talking to? And I think this process of listening to the impulse to breathe starts to connect these two aspects of ourself in that phrase that Osensei left us with one plus one equals one, that really it's not one or the other. It's not our right side or our left side. It's not our mind or our body any more than it's the in-breath or the out-breath or sleeping or being awake or eating and getting hungry again. All these dualities that are manifestations of the two forces of the universe, I think show up most simply, most consistently, most accessibly through the connection of the attention with the experience. And the most tangible form of that is listening to the impulse to breathe and i'll emphasize again i don't mean just sitting and watching it i mean listening to it as if that aspect of yourself we're talking to the aspect of yourself that points the attention towards it and as those two start to do that they spiral together as it were and i think bob was saying yesterday you know don't don't worry about the spiral just Notice that when you listen to the impulse to breathe and you actually connect your conscious breath with that, I like the term deeper aspect of the self, more original aspect of the self. Essentially, again, using Bob's terminology, you start to hit a finer dimension. Now, I would say a finer dimension of being. I also like the term awareness, but I understand Bob's concern that people can know about things and being aware of something in that sense of knowing about it is actually almost detrimental. It takes you away from the experiential aspect and that's fundamental. So for those of you who are familiar with my Aikido and 3 easy lessons layout, which was me trying to distill What's essential in this art? What are we doing here? What's consistent through every technique? Because when I started, there was a lot of this, you do this and you do that in Irami and Tenkan and Shionaga and Kodagaishi and Ikkyo and Sankyo. And, but I thought, what's consistent there? And the one thing that's consistent for me is that you're feeling where you are. You're in the experience of what's happening for you. And then the dimension or the quality the refinement of that attention i think is a lot of what we're working on now we'll do a few more exercises in a couple minutes and then i think we want to chat about this but i've started most of these classes by saying what's important and what do you want and to me that's a way of bringing you back to feeling yourself and connecting with this original self if you will uh, the words to me are things to play with. They're like the notes in music. They don't really necessarily mean that much. But when you put them together, they create something. So listening to the impulse to breathe starts to connect these two aspects of ourself or the individual with the universal, whatever. And that dimensional shift of awareness or uh, a finer sense of being or a more present connection with experience has a power to it that 
has the potential of unfolding in our lives. And in the same way that once we start listening to the impulse to breathe, it really represents listening to the impulse of life itself. And again, I, I'm emphasizing over and over to you uh, that what's important is your direct connection with the Aikikami or your inner teacher or the force or whatever you want to call it. And I've said to you repeatedly, these are my stories. You have to experience it yourself to see if they're true. But this direct connection with the universe that those of us who teach or like I prefer to see us as senior students uh, can help with, um, we can't really replace it. We can teach you how to surf, but you got to stand up on your own board and make your own adjustments to make sure that you're in relationship to the wave of your life. And I'm not discouraging you from teachers or like I say, going and studying the 108 poses of yoga or all the techniques of Aiki that are commonly taught. Uh, all of that is good. Going and studying with, in my case, music teachers or whatever has been good. but I hope there's a time when you connect directly to your own music, when you write your own song. And that doesn't mean you don't sing other people's songs. Uh, maybe even try and sing them just like they sing them, but I would hope somewhere down the line, you would see how they come through you in your uniqueness, that you find a way to accomplish your bestowed mission. This was, I was really enjoying this with Bob because it's been a major theme in our conversations these last Wiles, and God, the guy must be bored under house arrest to talk to me as much as he has of late. But this sense that he emphasized, again, I'm not trying to get people to do what I do. And he was emphatic that Osensei was not trying to create martial artists. And I said to him at one point, well, I thought that was always kind of something you inferred, but it sounds like you're saying he was pretty explicit. And Bob said, no, he, he was very explicit, you know, that... Uh, he does what he does. He is a martial artist. He started at seven. He was, it was major in his makeup, as it were. But that what he was saying was the principles are the same in every lineage. You know, mechanic, poet, uh, you know, chef, plumber, it doesn't matter, artist, business person, uh, parent, uh, co-worker, boss, it doesn't matter. The same fundamental principles apply here. So that's what we want to work on. I want to come back to this unified field of the you that you know and the you that you don't or the breath that you take consciously and the breath that's always happening to you and connecting those into one field. And I've been using Osensei's poetry of the floating bridge of heaven because he emphasized so repeatedly according to every report I've ever gotten, that you must stand on the floating bridge of heaven or Aikido will not come forth. You must stand on the floating bridge of heaven or you cannot do Aikido. And yet, when I go back through my years, I don't think anyone ever talked about it. Now, I think Bob also had kind of a, a sense that it was so holy in a way that how do you even dare talk about it in a funny way? And yet, I would say Bob has always been talking about it in his own way. And his um, process has always pointed us towards bringing the left side and the right side into a balance that connects the two. Um, you know, do you want me to be strong or you want me to be soft? I want you to be both. And I would say standing on the floating bridge of heaven means one foot in the mundane or manifest world and one foot in the heavenly or divine world. And when I say divine, what I mean is the essence of where creativity manifests in this world. That the concept that he spoke of repeatedly was Take Musu Aiki. And Take is often translated as the marshal. But I'm going to, because I'm so charmingly irreverent, I hope, I'm going to call that a little differently. Take is the realm of function. It's the realm of ability. It's the realm of practicality. And it's the realm of being able to exist in the physical. Feed yourself. Breathe. Um, 
make friends, work together with people, build a house or keep your house working or all the, get your car running, whatever it is, get to where you're going, all the practical stuff that could apply in a sense should you need to defend yourself. But the concept of Budo, the path of the warrior, was to stop war. It's not about fighting. It's how to create, well, Bruce Lee say so charmingly, I call it the art of fighting without fighting. It's a transformation of our being. And I'm going to go just a little longer here because these couple points to me are, are kind of the foundation of where we're going to go with our exercises. That this ability to stop the war or stop the fight between the breath that's happening throughout you, that's activating you, that has brought life to your being and the breath that you take in a conscious realm, that the life force of your essence, of your, if I dare use the word self, is connected with the person that you know that everybody recognizes that somebody gave a name to before you could talk. Uh, someone told you how to be this and how to be that and taught you to do this. There's so much formed that comes from the external and that we fit to, all of which is not wrong, it's good, as long as you do not disassociate from your inner teacher, from your higher self, from the Aikikami, from the divine force, from the life force itself in you. So if we're good with that, I wanna to touch one more point that one of the teachers brought up to me and I do appreciate those of you who reach out and, and, and share. As we said, Bob also likes to hear uh, not only your questions, but your stories. And, and to be in conversation, in a sense, about the real work that we're doing here, which I don't think for most of us is Nikyo or Shihonage. But that's a form that we use to practice it. The work the essence of unifying these two aspects of our being until the next dimension of ourself shows through till we accomplish our bestowed mission till we bring our uniqueness to play i like to call it in the symphony that each of us plays our part well in the symphony this trusting that force in the face of the fact that a lot of people are telling you how you should be and I'm sure the majority of them mean well. But it's important that while you listen and learn to everyone, you're connecting all the manifest world to this divine force. And so when I say listening to the impulse to breathe, that starts that connection. And I had said, now seek the source of the impulse to breathe. And one of the teachers said to me, well, I get listening but I don't get anywhere with seeking the source. And my sense of it is not, uh, I think I said to him, it's not a destination. It's a way of traveling. So as you're listening to the breath and you're listening to the impulse to breathe and you're harmonizing your breath with that impulse that's breathing you and those two begin this merging, there's just a shift to a finer dimension. And in that finer dimension, I think you can begin to feel the impulse at a finer level. And that's all I mean by seeking the source of the impulse. It's not a, a head trip. It's not an idea. It's not something you can name. It's an experiential feeling into how it originates in you. And that should be a koan. That should be the sound of one hand clapping. That should be something that you can't quite bring together in a uh, conscious way necessarily. But um, this process of standing on the floating bridge is to me the essence of what we're doing here. And I don't wanna say I know what it is. I wanna say if you aren't making an attempt to stand on the floating bridge, if you aren't, somehow sensing into yourself in a way that says, where is, and again, the divine word may not work for you, but where is my connection to the origin of creation? And again, those words are so lofty that, and, and Bob is always concerned when we start to talk like this, that everyone's gonna head trip. 
And of course, I like to say, well, of course, if we tell them to center, they're going to head trip that too. So it's inevitable that our minds are going to run off with this. But how do you correct into an experiential domain? And I'd say, be listening, be connecting. I looked at a lot of places and almost nowhere did I see anything where people actually spoke about it in terms of standing on the floating bridge. I think a lot of people have taught pieces of it or aspects that start to represent that study. But I come back to this quote from one of the Deshi that uh, Chris Lee brought up in his blog. And he said, the, he said, the Deshi said, well, since always said, we must stand on the floating bridge of heaven. If we don't stand on the floating bridge of heaven, Aikido won't, won't come forth. But we didn't uh, know where this floating bridge was. Uh, so he said, the Deshi said, so we didn't know where this floating bridge was or how to stand on it. So we just put on a good face and kept applying techniques to each other. And I don't mean to be rude and I don't mean to be insensitive to what they were struggling with. Nonetheless, these are the people who then went out to teach Aikido. And I think we've got a world full of people putting on a good face and applying techniques to each other. They have very little sense of this concept of unifying one plus one equals one. And that's why I started out with my gratitude to Bob, because I felt like he's always taught this, even though he didn't use these phrases. And for you to connect at least with the impulse to breathe. And then I would say with the impulse of life. So if we carry it out a bit, that you work the right job, Bob tells his story about being in the wrong job and the guy caught it and helped him make that shift. Uh, I saw a thing once that said, you know, 20 things you should do in your life. Number one was marry the right person because 90% of your happiness or unhappiness will come from that one single decision. And I think that ability to connect with your path and do what you want to do is so fundamental to the fulfillment. I have always said my greatest fear is getting to the end of my life and finding out it was someone else's. This thing for me is so essential. It's why I'm here in the art. It was to tune into, I make the joke about hearing, uh, knowing the guy wanted to hit me and leaving the bar before he knew it. And, and uh, in effect, moving my life in this magical realm. And I've talked a lot, I'm gonna stand up now, I'm gonna invite you to. Um, I've talked a lot about the, what I call neural energy and, uh, the energy that activates the physical body. The body doesn't just move, you have to move some muscles to move the body. And in order to move the muscles, you have to send some energy to the nerves that activate the muscles. And I've kind of stayed with that as a very simple explanation. I'm gonna ask you to start to open and reach as far as you're comfortable. And then maybe just a little bit further where you start to get that stretch going on. And I want you to feel that upward motion. And I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Okay, come back and relax. First exercise we did first week, I believe. We did a forward, come back, back, come back. And we said, how did you know you're there? What are the keys that tell you that you're in the right place? And the second week, we talked about aligning and allowing. And when you're aligned properly with gravity, your muscles can relax because the skeletal structure supports you. And in this relaxation, there's an allowing of all the flow of life energy or, or however you want to see the, the force that is you that activates the breath itself that drives everything. And I want to say there's so much distraction in our world that we have to take care of in the Take world that we lose this musu, the birthing or the creativity that's unfolding in our lives. I'm going to come back and say, after that thing from Chris Lee's piece, I never really found much of anything else. And I looked and looked. I saw uh, one of the guys was doing a little bit I'm trying to get both the vertical and the horizontal together. And I thought that was nice. It's probably kind of a, his way of uh, 
the manifest and the divine or something like that, standing in heaven and earth at the same time, something. At least he was clearly making an approach on it, and I sincerely appreciated that. And I don't know how many of you know Bill Gleason, an old friend of mine. We, we grew up together in Minneapolis and learned to play guitar together. We still talk once in a while. And I happened to look at his book the other day, which he had given me. And he said, two forces, uh, wisdom and compassion at one with the universal spirit. I'm not sure where he came up with wisdom and compassion, but I understand something of the being in that sense at one with the universal spirit, you at one with the universal spirit, this is to stand on the floating bridge of heaven. And here we go into our work now. Individual will merges with that of the universe and creativity begins. All right, so stretching a little further yet, a little further yet. Okay, so that first week we did forward and back and then uh, the aligning, allowing, appreciating, the, what I call meditation microdosing. Then I think last week we did a um, little further yet, just a little further. I want you to stay a little beyond your comfort zone for a little longer than you're comfortable. And then last week we did the right side, left side, coming into center, finding that point that is it both left and right or is it neither left and right? And this is going to cause a little bit of an upward motion as you reach. And let's exaggerate that a little bit by trying to, as if you could, hold yourself up off the ground. And then I want to let everything go and feel as if you will, some aspect of you going deeper and deeper into the ground. Last week we talked about, I started to introduce the concept of what I call the gravity shadow. Like I said, the sunlight produces a shadow on the surface. Your weight produces a gravity shadow in the earth. Somewhere in the earth, there's an absorption of this weight. And that shadow of your being in the earth is an important aspect of our connection on the floating bridge in this description. Okay? So once again, I'm going to invite you to kind of lift your weight up. And I like this stretching out because it's always good to get a little range of motion practice. Always good to get a little isometric strengthening Always good to start to focus the intention into activity and feel how you do that. And that upward motion, and yet, of course, your weight's still going into the earth, but you'll feel it much more as you let everything down and you can kind of start to imagine, pretend, feel your gravity shadow dispersing into the earth. And let's spread it more and more, or imagine, pretend that you could spread it more and more into the earth. And now I'm gonna have an uke come on either side of me and try and lift me up. And I'm sensing into my gravity shadow and my fingertips are also sensing into their gravity shadow even though they're not touching the earth per se. And everything in me now is sensing into that gravity shadow. And now I'm gonna get four ukes, two on each arm to try and lift me up. So one thing I love about working with imaginary ukes is you're really good. But are you all with me? And I want to invite you always, stop me. If you don't get it or you need some help or I'm not speaking clearly enough, all right? So I'm playing with that moment where all my weight connects to the earth and there's this unliftable. I think oh, Mr. Tohei used to talk about that. He used to do these exercises. He'd get four guys to hold him up in the air and then he'd just do his gravity shadow thing and they couldn't hold him. He just dropped them. All right. This connecting to this gravity shadow right now, I want to take it a little bit further in your imagination. And again, I'm going to leave you with this stuff to work with because uh, next week we'll work on the concept that it's your art now. How do you take this into your own creativity when your individual will merges with the universal will? Creativity begins. What are you going to do with that? And how will you work with that? And I'd like to help leave you with that. And then well, I guess we'll do one more class in May. And that's be another one of my famous last classes. And we'll try and tie it all together one last time and leave you with these practices so that 
you on your own can connect to the Aikikami. You can study directly with the Aikikami, like Osensei did. You may not be Osensei, you aren't Osensei. You're you, and you'll study your own study with the Aikikami, and it will produce in your lineage, not necessarily a martial artist, but whatever's important in your makeup, okay? So I'm playing with this now, and uh, for a second there, they could have lifted me up again. They were patient and didn't, but all of a sudden now they can't lift me. And are we in sync here? Can you play with that feeling a little bit? All right. So there were a couple of points I liked to do with this, and I'm going to uh, – we use this uh, showman strike. Like I said, I, I, I think one of the martial problems with Aikido is we use such classical – uh, Japanese attacks that they aren't common in the Western world. And, and if you dealt with a mixed martial artist or drunk in the bar or whatever, that's not how they would attack. So I would say that the showman strike is now them grabbing a beer bottle and trying to hit you over the head with it. And I'm just going to, again, move over, just brush it slightly to the side and maintaining my gravity shadow here. I'm touching them on the elbow now, and I'm starting to bring them just slightly off their balance. So if I were the attacker here, uh, my weight would be on their elbow and I'd be taking it just slightly off this way, okay? We good? Stop me if you need to. So I've moved off and I've begun to bring their elbow just slightly out of range so that their balance is now beginning to drift. And if you can imagine their gravity shadow is now starting to locate a little off of their center. Does that work for you? So I'm here, I've dragged their uh, gravity shadow just slightly off and now they're being magnetized by their own gravity shadow downward into this deeper place can't help but think about it probably at moments but play with it experientially let's go back to you here as you feel that shadow drop into the earth disperse through the earth if you can imagine it now through the earth, it's connecting to the sun because the earth's gravity is affected in that larger field. The sun's gravity through the galaxies, the galaxies through the universe, the universe through the totality of creation. You're a part of that. And however conceptual you might get lost in thinking about it, when you start to feel into it, it becomes more accessible to you. This universal energy and you that you know start to unify like you in the impulse to breathe, the origin of the impulse to breathe, the source of the gravity shadow, the universe, the creation itself. And if you play the game just for a minute, just feel into it, I'm going to guess there's a little sense, and you're not sure if you're imagining it, and that's true when you enter the next finer dimension. And that's why it's nice to have real ukes because you get a little more feedback. Okay, and I'm just bringing them down into that and they're falling down. And I'm really not doing that much. Uh, other than this cultivation of the spirit of attraction by which we draw the whole of the opponent to ourself. And I think, um, as I like to say, it's why Aikido looks so incredibly fake to people who don't understand it and the people who have only done the mechanical work and so i'm going to take you into another exercise if we're good with this if you've had a few of these and you can picture again that you've you've drawn them off and their own gravity shadow is pulling them down and you just add your energy to that the littlest bit here and you can just feel that there's no effort they're just their neural energy is taken back into its own gravity shadow Okay, so these are concepts, play with them a little bit. Let's do uh, a setup for a shihonage. Katate dori, come over the top, grab the, grab the wrists here, and we're torquing the wrist just slightly so that they can't really reach you with the other hand. There's enough of that extension there. Okay, I'm going to slide underneath and do a shihonage. Pretty simple move. 
slide pivot. Okay, I think I did uh, in the second class, maybe it was the third, I can't remember. This, this move with the sword, huh? That I just let go and it's sort of the most natural thing in the world. Okay, that movement, that basis here as we step back. Now I think a lot of people get into Shihonaga and they grab the wrist here and they kind of want to pull down on it. They come up on top and pull down on it. I don't want to do that at all. And those of you who have worked with me on this have actually felt this, where I move into this position here. And I usually let go at this point and their gravity shadow takes them to the earth. Because I'm not coming up here, I'm dropping into my gravity shadow here and I'm pulling them into their, magnetically pulling them into their gravity shadow. All right, now it's great if you've got a real uke because I remember doing this one in Switzerland and they just couldn't believe it. They were just standing there with their mouths open kind of because I would get to hear and let go and they would fall. And they're used to this as shihonage, all right? Same thing with the sword. It's like, no, no. It's like just bringing the sword into your gravity shadow. Okay, let me see here how we're doing. We got a few more minutes, I think. All right, so the movement is virtually meaningless since there's nobody really there. But this sense of moving under the ground, moving under the earth. In Tai Chi, we had an exercise where we would, you know, transfer the weight under the ground. So when you, by the time you'd put this foot down, your weight was already there and you could float the other foot. Okay? It's a little similar to that. This weight, this relaxation, this weight under the ground and drawing them. Now, I'm going to guess if your acuity is good, if you're feeling yourself, if you're paying attention, you're going to feel, I'm going to exaggerate it now, this kind of rising sort of sense. And sometimes it'll take your mind. It'll take you uh, out of this gravity shadow or connection to the earth or what I really like to think of as standing on the floating bridge because when you do it, it's like at this point, I don't even want to do shihonaga. I just want to touch the inside of their elbow here and they're going to fall down. It's why my, my movements were so unpredictable. I used to go into train in Oakland on my way into noon class with Bob before I'd go to my capoeira class with Bira and then evening class with Bob and that was how my days went on the good days. And uh, in Oakland, uh, Pat was training there then. And I remember her, she said to me one day, I just want to never know what you're going to do. And I thought, isn't that exactly what we want? Isn't that exactly what we're trying to create here? If I were going to say the same thing over and over again, who'd want to listen to me? Who wouldn't want to be part of a more creative experience? So I want to do a couple more minutes when your will and the divine will unify. Okay, and I think that's a little bit where the Judeo-Christians went off base because it was all giving it up to God. And it's like, Ho oh, Sensei said, it's got to come through you. You've gotta, it's gotta come through your body. It's gotta come through the manifest realm in you. You're not, not supposed to be here. You are supposed to be here. And you're supposed to be here to bring what you are. But again, as Bob was talking about, for most of us, we need the Masogi because we're so I here that the universal can't come through. But when the two are in perfect balance, left, right, there's a center. Mind, body, there's a being. Divine, mundane, or manifest, we're on the floating bridge of heaven. And the potentials here are so completely beyond what's 
possible in the realm of someone who doesn't stand on the floating bridge that it makes no sense, as I say, Aikido looks so fake. All right, I'm gonna take a last minute here and invite you to gab your, your ukes, have them attack any which way, slow motion, so you got a little time to play with it, and just begin to uh, notice when you lose the gravity shadow, you become over-involved in the mundane world, and return. Calm the spirit, return to the source. All the problems in this world emanate from the fact that people have forgotten that everything comes from a single source. Having a little trouble with my screen here, forgive me. So you're with your uke now, I hope. And you're doing whatever slow motion jiwaza with your uke. Am I good? Okay, I'm back here for a so I can see myself as well. I hope you didn't lose me. And I'm playing with this sense of there's a natural, they can't lift me up now. They can't even push me. There's so much depth into the totality of the earth that even on one foot, it's impossible. And so I'm And you have your own ukes, and you can imagine strikes coming. There's a guy coming from behind me now, and I'm turning kind of in a Riminage style. No, it's turning back into a Nikyo, and so on and so forth. Keep going. Impulse to breathe. Listening to the impulse to breathe connects you with that presence that feels your gravity shadow but you have a couple last minutes here with your imaginary ukes. And if you're feeling great, bring in two, but keep them slow so that you've got the presence, the time you need to come back to that standing on the floating bridge, that feeling of connecting. Uh, today we're playing with the gravity shadow as our approach here. Okay, last minute on the floating bridge with our imaginary ukes, and again, I'm. I'm using two now. And I have that same sense of just floating in the depth of the earth itself. And there's a, an ease, an allowing of the musculature. There's an allowing of the spirit itself. Okay, and a last, last minute, impulse to breathe, connecting it. Playing with some of the isometric quality through the body and gravity shadow, meaning I'm connecting with so much more into the earth itself. And as you get better, you'll feel that connection to the totality of the earth to the solar system. And again, I don't mean to trip you out. I mean to play with the feeling, imaginary at first, feeling of a larger connection to a total universal self. Okay? So in the beginning, the energy hits us. After a while, we kind of open and settle, and the energy kind of works with us a little bit better, or it becomes more of an ally to us. And as we play with this floating bridge at some point, we become this universal self. There is no energy hitting us. We are the universe. Or is it both sides of the sword or is, is it neither side, that sharp edge? Is the center both left and right or is it neither left nor right? Is this universal self both you and the universe or is it neither? And I'll play with neither just for the moment that so many of those aspects talk about the void. And that there's, in a sense, there's no one here in that way. What was your name before your parents were born? There's just energy itself flowing and it manifests in the manifest realm. 
it's divine in the divine realm. And in another realm, is it both or neither? There's no separation. Let's come back in. Last minute of just settling into that gravity shadow. Front back. Align with gravity. Left, right. Align with gravity. I use the word spirit. I know it's not a great word for a lot of people. It's too mystical or too ghosty, but uh, that's why I like the impulse to breathe because that is your spirit. Impulse to breathe and deepening into that shadow until your weight is, here's an imaginary story, dispersed throughout the earth, into the earth and through the whole earth. And that was that level where I think they couldn't lift him or they couldn't do whatever. And again, all this has that there's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. Okay. If you're ready, let's sit and chat for a minute. And if you'd rather just sit and play with your imaginary ukase, I won't take it personally. I've always supported you in doing what's right for you. There's nothing that I particularly want from you other than as much as you'd care to, let's work together and see if we can't keep all beings in a constant state of growth and development and serve for the completion of the universe. Hi, Chris here from New Zealand. Please. Um, I've always enjoyed the imagery in the UK that you introduced, um, especially in these moments, the, um, and centering and, and moving through, I guess the levels, it's the flow that always gets me and you can appreciate the flow and you don't have that other <laughs> UK directly a lot more. And it seems to stretch out the before, the after, the, um, through the movement, um, which then goes back into your, Aikido with an UK, which I always really enjoy as well. And um, it seems to, it shifts backwards and forwards, but certainly in, that, in those moments of flow, in that level, that dimension of flow is um, magnified, I guess. It's, um, it's one of the beautiful things about Aikido and that the, um, the project of dimensionality, I guess. So thank you. Thank you much. Uh, you know, we used to do a lot of work with imaginary UKs. In class, we would stop and do, do time in class with imaginary ukes. This has been a fundamental part of our practice, and in part because I think it takes away some of the distraction and brings us back to this internal space. Uh, what did Bob say yesterday? It's an internal development art. I don't know if you remember that phrase, but I thought that was so beautiful. And it's like why I say I feel so grateful to have found him in that way. Uh, that was central. Anyway, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate that. Can I just, just add, yeah, thank you, um, add a little bit to that. Do you think in that flow, when we're flowing without an imaginary UK, with our imaginary UK, that that's more of a truer line through emotion? So when you do actually have your UK, we end up sort of going all eye, going a bit head case and make up different lines? Whereas the lines from without the with the imaginary UK seem smoother, fuller, longer, as I said before, but we shorten them as soon as you know we're in a situation. Um, I quite often notice when I after that because I quite often do that as well, imaginary UK in class. And then when you get the UK, that it seems it seems nicer. It seems like the lines, the techniques, they um, have truer form. They've got a better, oh, I guess, source. Well, I think the, the game is if your training is good, you'll notice the discrepancies between your work with an actual uke, physical uke, or whatever we want to call them, and an imaginary uke. But I think as your training continues, as your gravity shadow spreads more evenly throughout the earth and throughout the universe in that sense, um, whatever that feeling is. And again, I know it, it's bound to trip thinking about it, but I'm just playing with a, a sense of it in this way. Um, I think what you find is uh, 
They're the same. They're the same. Yeah. So my sense, Chris, is yes, there is something true about the imaginary uke because you can't blame anything on anyone else. So it all <laughs> comes back to your internal awareness. And, um, but I do believe, and it was my experience, that once your training is good in that dimension, uh, you find that real ukes feel imaginary in the sense that there is no resistance. So here I'll, yeah. I'll go off onto a track. We'll touch on this tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow, next week. Um, I used to say every technique that you do should be kokyanage. Even if you're doing nikyo, it should be kokyanage. And to me, kokyanage, which they translate as breath power throw, and again, as I like to take my incredibly irreverent liberties with these things and say, no, it's to harmonize with the power that activates their breath. It's like I say, I don't throw the physical, I deal with the energy that activates the physical and really, and where I want to go next week and, and hopefully touch into it a little greater depth is when you send that neural energy from your original intent, Where's that intent coming from? What is the actual source of the intention of your life? And how do you connect with your, I love the term bestowed mission. Uh, it's, it's kind of mundane manifest and it's clearly divine at the same time. So I'll leave you with that one and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you. While we're waiting, we're, of course, listening to our impulse to breathe. Of course, we're seeking the source of it. Uh, seeking may be the wrong word. And we're aligning with the force of gravity. We're aligning with the essence of our spirit. We're allowing the muscles to relax. We're allowing the spirit to calm, to open settle uh bob here please in the class last night the docent is talking about kind of unwinding unraveling in that sense and i think the practice you just led us through was very very effective in doing that it's it's been fascinating to me the resonance i've been feeling uh with bob at this point and the work he's been doing and, and again, like I said, I think he, he never used the term floating bridge, but, but that's where he was always taking us. And, and I, I have this sense that uh, opening and settling, as it will, like he said, the, the spiral begins to show itself. And all that, all that stuff said to me, yeah, all we really need to do is, in effect, say yes. Yes to the spirit, yes to the impulse to breathe, or however you want to think about it. And if you stay with it or come back to it repeatedly, maybe it's a better way to think about it. Um, it will take you into dimensions you never imagined. And, and literally in my life, it's taken me places where I don't know how I could have ever gotten there, but I found myself doing work in the international peace building realms. I would have always loved to have gone there, but it was magic. Now, Bob loves to get on my case and say, well, but you did do something. And I say, no, I didn't. We had a great little moment yesterday. I said, well, but what I mean by that and why I love to drive you crazy with this is it's not the small I. It's not the I, I, I that he always says, easy, the I. It was the, and I think with Mike the week before, he had asked me a question. I was saying, well, but who are you? Which you are we talking about? Because once you've dropped your gravity shadow into the totality, once you are the universe in that sense, that I am the universe is not the little I anymore. Anyway, it, it's, it's beautiful to me the way it kind of naturally uncoils, if that's back to your turn, Bob. For me today, it's definitely helped um, feeling more centered, but this practice reminds me of something I, I did a couple decades ago, I guess for fun in high school to avoid paying attention in class. I would imagine I was shadow boxing and uh, in some cases back then, I would actually get a really good visual of the Nuki, not just, you know, standing, imagining it, but a good visual. And um, in some cases, um, 
not in the past few months, but earlier last year, um, while maybe getting into this state um, in the late hours of the night doing Keiko or meditation, I would again get a visual that it wasn't just me imagining Uke visiting, but somebody or something was visiting, whether it was an actual person I knew doing out of body, which I've experienced some of that with confirmation, or if it's Aikikami, or, you know, if I just have a really good imagination, but I definitely felt like today and what you're teaching and what um, Nadao Sensei is teaching is guiding me back to that place I was a couple decades ago and earlier last year to where I felt more at center with myself, with the Aikikami, with the floating bridge. And I keep falling off that bridge or jumping, but I'm going to try to stay on it. <laughs> oh, Sensei said my students think I don't lose my center or my stance on the floating bridge. But that's not true. I simply recognize it sooner and I get back quicker. Calm the spirit, return to the source. And as to what's real, I have no way of knowing. Even with your ukes, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes what's really going on. They help, but stay in the process, which it sounds like what you're doing. And uh, I think it, it teaches itself to you as much as you're open to allowing it. And I guess I would come back to that there is a great human propensity for self-delusion. And we can tell ourselves and convince ourselves of almost anything or something. And it's why I come back to gravity shadow, uh, left, right, center, align, allow, appreciate. Something that brings us back in from the, oh, oh, you know, kind of place. I think if you stay true with yourself that way, you should be okay. Sounds, sounds like this, again, I use the word divine, this creativity is always calling us. This creativity is always wanting to come through us. And um, anybody who sings along with the radio in the car when no one's listening, it's, it's there, it's always there. For the most part, we've been told to you know, sit still, be quiet, you can't sing, whatever the, the repressions are on this natural expression. And because you know, we can get out of that gravity shadow and be erratic and inappropriate. So trying to find the right balance, that's our study. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Just wanna add one extra piece on that. When I was doing one meditation a couple of decades ago, you know, left my body, you know, thought I was imagining it, but my first thought was to go to my Aikido sensei's house. Went and visited, saw her turn around, and I felt like I should leave, and I had a different experience. The next time I saw my sensei, she asked me what I was doing in her house. So that experience is one of the things that kept me attached to Aikido when I couldn't train while I was in the military. So I just wanted to share that. I've heard lots of those kinds of stories, and I, all I have to say about them is anything that helps you deepen your practice, keep it up. Richard, this is Lauren. I'm sorry, but your camera has turned off again. Uh, not I, I know. Side, and so people can't see you. What a loss. Okay. I'm going to bring it back on here as quickly as I can. But what's important here, and we're basically done for the day, i just like to spend a few minutes, if you're willing to stay with me a bit, and hear a little from you uh, as it helps. And I'm sure, like, we send the questions on to Bob. Just it helps me understand the vocabulary that we share so we can speak together more creatively as we come together couple more classes and, and then I'm gonna quit again. I'll, I'll say something, this is Dusty. And yeah, thank you for the class. I really like that there's something about this imaginary uke and practicing creativity. It's, um, it feels integrative and there's, there's something there. So I appreciate that. 
My question is, um, what is intention when you talk about seek the source of the impulse to breathe? Like, where does intentionality fit into that piece? It's a it's a deep question, Dusty. And um, like I say, well, I think I'll try and get there. I'll try and focus there more primarily uh, next week as we focused under the mat in my terminology this week a bit more. Um, but even directing that attention towards feeling your gravity shadow is a focus of intention. And there is some power that emanates from us that allows us to raise our arm, uh, you know, whatever it is, build a, whatever you do, if you're a carpenter or a mechanic or bake something or what, you know, that just, there's some force that activates through us. And then even when we intentionally do a specific Aikido technique, and I'm going to come back and say somewhere in there, like I said, everyone gets, I can feel the impulse to breathe, just stop for a minute and it, it becomes un, uh, unavoidable, unignorable. But the source of that impulse is something that exists at a finer dimension and you can only approach it as you stay with the moving towards the audible, silent, invisible breath as you unify the left and right into the center itself and a, the next dimension begins to show. A finer sensing, a finer awareness or uh, dimension of experience begins to happen. And so I think I'm going to leave it with, uh, I want you to study that this week. And I want you to come back with a little something next week and see if you can't help us create some vocabulary, create some words, create some way of talking about something that we've never developed vocabulary for. We really haven't developed the, uh, if you would call it muscle memory, I would call it uh, sensory acuity memory of tuning into where our intention comes from. And most of us are at effect of our intention. And it's why we can end up yelling at somebody we love or, you know, we do all the stupid things we do and come back and go, God, I lost it. Mm -hmm. And so it's that it that we're seeking. And I'm, I'm going to say that it's, it's a good place for all of us to be playing with and exploring uh, for when we get together next week. Because I think somewhere in there is the essence of the mystery itself. And I don't expect we're going to be able to answer it. But I do expect we will become more sensitive, more attuned, more unified with it. I'll leave you there. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, this is Carl. Hi, Carl. I'm, I'm wondering about the eye. Mm -hmm. um, the dif differentiation between the small eye that's being easied, easy the eye, and the uh, the deeper, <clears throat> whatever it is, finer dimension of uh, self. And even O Sensei, at least in his quotes, is being said, I do this or I am that. Um, is there a way to catch on to I am accomplishing my dis bestowed mission, but I'm the small eye, or am I the larger eye, the deeper eye? What do you um, think? I think that it's a good question, and as I'm so wont to do, I would say I want you to spend some time with the Aikikami or your inner sensing of what that is and, and see what shows up for you. But let me, let me share the, just the sense that it's not um, initially distinct in the smaller dimensions. And so it's easy to get confused there. But the couple things that we do know is that you pick it. We have a left and a right and they come together in a place that we call center. Is it left and right? Is it neither? Uh, but you can find something closer to your center. You can, when you do that centering or aligning with the force of gravity, almost naturally start to relax into the ground or become more grounded or become something like that. So 
when you feel the forehead wrinkling around the question, go back to, in Bob's words, opening. And I think you do that through left, right, or you do that through your in-breath, out-breath, or the up pulse and the down pulse, and centering, grounding. And I think if you just stay with that process, a lot of those questions get answered. But again, these are my stories. Play with it, see what you come back with. Well, I have been doing that for a while. Um, I hope I have 400 years to continue. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, it's never enough. And Bob says, you know, Sensei says that, you know, he's, I mean, like he said, where I am, this is kindergarten. And, 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 and he says uh, to Bob, uh, you know, he's, he, he, he wished he had done better. He wished he had done, he should have done more. He should, you know, and I, I, I guess if, if, uh, if he were here and we were having a drink together, I'd just say, he's the eye and I totally know what you mean. Got to have a certain balance of your reverence with your irreverence, otherwise you lose the floating bridge. Oh yeah, I just uh, just following up from last week, the time I spent with it. This week, I know we had a conversation. I thought some more about it even today. It was class. Um, I think it's about relationship for me and kind of the blend of that process of 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 gravity. Gravity is happening, whether I think about it or don't think about it. Um, but my conscious blending with it changes the relationship last hour was not that I have to think a lot too much about standing, but I, I felt like I had to put just that much less of my conscious thought into standing. The more I, the deeper I was able to drop into the ground with that process, kind of like the, the more below I was, the less I had to be above in terms of consciousness. It's something I just sort of felt a moment ago. Yeah, I think that the way we know ourselves starts to dissolve. That's a scary one for a lot of people. And I think that's the place where they tend to, to cut out. When Bob, um, not long after I started training with Bob, I mean, way, way back. And we're talking, you know, 45 years now or something like that. And maybe, maybe even longer than that. Um, he hit this thing where he started talking about base, base connection, and it, what I call power under the mat. But, but, and that there was a place there where you start to hit a kind of a darkness in terms of what you know and how you know yourself. And like he said, we lost a lot of people in that realm. A lot of people just didn't, didn't want to go through that uh, unknown place. And I'd come back to... Um, that's the place where these other tricks are so valuable because if you've got a mantra that works for you, uh, that you believe in, uh, if you've got an impulse to breathe that you can connect with, if you have a centering practice, if you have uh, a lot of times during the earlier times, I would just think about Osensei as my mentor or my um, image of, of someone to help me stay in a courageous place when I would be somehow uncomfortable and I would say actually afraid of losing myself there. And, uh, and there have been other, whatever you want to call them, magic potions I've used. But I think there is a place where you start to dissolve and there's seemingly no one there. I don't think that's bad. I think that's good. I think the more you easy the eye, if we're back to those terms, there's nobody there, and yet there is. Is it both or is it neither? And if you lose your sense of humor, it's not funny. It sounds good to me. What you're describing sounds exactly like part of the process. And I'd say, keep your breath and hang in. Thanks for that, Richard. I actually had a few, a couple of sleepless nights and I actually was focusing in on just there in bed, just like feeling the dispersion of my of my weight mm -hmm. and sort of became like a practice of how to fall into deeper sleep through that process as I was kind of like just unable. So there was something I just kind of the resonance of like, you know, you're talking about Bob being woken up in the middle of the night for being inspired. Mm -hmm. You've been mm -hmm. named like I've, mm -hmm. that was a, there was a touch of that for me. I felt like I love maybe, it. maybe what you're describing is true, but like, I no, just, there's something in 
teaching. Yeah, I guess that what it brings up for me to say to all of you is, you know, like I said, these are my stories. I think as you start to play with it, maybe gravity shadow isn't your practice. Maybe expansion is your practice. Maybe, uh, you know, dispersion is your practice. I have no idea what the kami is going to say to you. And um, all I can say is if you're connecting with something fundamental, and I, to me, the spirit, which is the impulse to breathe in our mundane world, I'd trust it. I'd listen. And very much like you're saying, Sandy, bring it back to us and, and share it with others because not that yours is right then, but that each of us in finding our own will help the rest of us find our own and all together we'll create this beautiful symphony or create a beautiful world. I think we're close to time here. I don't want to cut anyone off. If there's something someone would love to share, I'd love to hear it. Take a last minute of listening to the impulse to breathe, aligning with the force of gravity, allowing the essence of being, opening and settling. And let's see if there is a last comment or two. Fairly easy. Hi, Richard. Um, Joanna, I have a Hi, question. Uh, don't know if that's for today. I don't know if I have uh, it uh, formally correctly, but about the Nikyo. What's the thing about the Nikyo? And I think it's a, it's a, it's a technique that we use that it's very easy to disconnect to, to the uke. Uh, and, and vice versa, also the okay about, I don't know, about the fear of getting hurt and how can you, how can we transform this, this technique? It's very, it's very par powerful, very delicate, very dangerous. And, and you said something about the, the Nikyo at first. I, I don't remember the, the whole sentence that, that you said, but I don't know. It's something that really tricks me a lot during my practices because it's something that I'm afraid of what my my Tori is gonna do with me, but I'm also afraid be, being somebody else's uh, Tori. What am I going to do to this person? So something about to to think these days and play with our imaginary rookies. Well, my my sense again here is this is fundamental to the way I approach the game. Uh, don't mean to say it's right or wrong, but um, every technique should be kokinage. And what I mean by that is instead of like yanking on the shihonage and pulling down, if you've done that gravity shadow connection or your blend is there in energy, um, when I would do Nikyo to people, well, at least when I would do it correctly, um, their expression was they, they didn't understand why they were going down or, or they would say, God, that's so weird. It didn't hurt at all. Or not that I didn't do plenty of bad Nikyos, don't get me wrong. But, but it says to me that the potential is there where there is no forcing involved. There's a unifying in an, in an energy dimension with the energy that's activating their physical. And as you start to blend with that kokyu in them, your Nikyo has no force to it in the physical realm. It's completely in the energetic realm and they don't feel it. They have no idea why they went down. And I've always liked that sensation because that's what I heard people said about being thrown by O sensei. I don't mean to compare us, but just to say that there's something in that approach to me of not, um, not using force, of blending and harmoniously moving into it. And uh, one of these days, Joanna, maybe we'll get a chance to get together and I'll be able to share it with you in physical feeling. But for right now, you're going to have to live with it in imagination. Play with it and see what okay. happens for you. See what comes to you. And I say this to all of you, you know, it's like, ask me, sure. Listen to what I have to say, sure. But do your direct questioning with the Aikikami. That's experiential. That's a feeling. That's, I don't even know what to call it, but, but it's something that you explore directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm close. Anybody left? I don't want to cut anybody off, but it's time probably for us to 
go our way. Next week, we'll work a little more on intention, uh, trying to source in at the next level. And I know we're going to lose, uh, I don't know how do I want to say this, we lose clarity as we go into these finer dimensions. It becomes vague or, like I say, you can't tell if you're imagining it. That's fine. Play with it for a little while. Uh, your Nikio is imaginary. I have a, this one of the girls that trained with me and, and the one who, if you, those of you who remember the story, who didn't want me to use a gun, was upset that I owned a gun and blah, blah, blah. I eventually wanted to learn how to shoot. Um, she used to come home from class and uh, her boyfriend would say, what'd you learn? And she'd show him this and he'd just mess with her. And then one night, you know, after, I don't know, it was probably about nine months of training or something like that. Uh, I guess we had done Nikio, as a matter of fact. And he goes, well, what'd you learn tonight? And he started to mess with her and she just put him on the floor. So what I'm saying is it's all imaginary when we start. It doesn't really work. But somehow if you hang in with your training, that's what's magic about this process. And then I just want to come back and say, make sure that you're listening to the kami in the sense of, in the inquiry of, are you training what you really want to be training? And don't look for a right answer. Just be open and settle into what you're experiencing. Keep exploring it. See what it shows you. Are we good? Again, my appreciation to Lauren, Kenneth, Bob, and to all of you for being with me and engaging in this inquiry together. If we're good, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. Thanks, gang. See you again. Thank you.